next, a professor in the history department, a writer for the New Yorker, and recently wrote The Whites of Their Eyes and coming out this year, The Mansion of Happiness, Professor Jill Lepore. Thanks very much, Pete. The title of my talk is different than what's in your program. I decided to take on something a little bit more modest. <laughs> talk to you about the meaning of life. And I'm going to tell you a story because that's what historians do. We tell stories. I don't have any good charts for you, but I have a lot to talk to you about with regard to happiness. I'm going to tell you a story about this man. In 1860, 10 years before the cornerstone was laid, for this building in which we're all spending this evening. A lanky, long-nosed, 23-year-old Harvard Engineering School dropout named Milton Bradley invented a board game. It's played on a red and ivory checkerboard of 64 squares. He called it the checkered game of life. In the journey of life, Bradley explained, there are good patches and bad in roughly equal number. On the one hand, honesty, bravery, success. On the other, poverty, idleness, disgrace. Play starts at the board's lower left corner on an ivory square labeled infancy, illustrated by a tiny black ink lithograph of a wicker cradle, and ends usually, but not always, at happy old age at the upper right. Even when you're heading for happiness, though, you can land in ruin, drunk and drooling on the floor, a debt collector darkening your door. Most questions about life and death have no answers, including notably these three. How does life begin? What does it mean? What happens when we die? No one has ever answered these questions, and no one ever will. But everyone tries. Trying is the human condition. And history is the chronicle of the asking. The history of games of life, then, contains within it a history of ideas about life itself. The checkered game of life made Milton Bradley a fortune. He grew up. He grew old. The company he founded survived his death in 1911. It survived the Depression. It survived two world wars. And then, in 1960, to celebrate its centennial, the Milton Bradley Company released a commemorative game of life. It bears almost no resemblance to its checkered 19th century namesake. Instead, Milton Bradley's game about vice, virtue, and the pursuit of happiness was recast in 1960 as a two-dimensional Levittown, complete with paychecks and retirement homes and medical bills. In this game of life, players fill teensy plastic station wagons with even teensier pink and blue plastic mommies and daddies, spin the wheel of fate and ride along the highway of life. Have you guys played this game? <laughs> In this game, you can have even teensier pink and blue plastic babies. And if you're lucky, you can retire at Millionaire Acres. As you will recall, losing to your brother or your big sister, whoever earns the most money wins. The rest of us go to the poorhouse. Inside that box is an awful lot of fun to play with. Piles of paper, fake automobile insurance, phony stock certificates, and play money. Seven and a half million dollars of it. And now I want you to remember that the man on this heap of mint green $50,000 bills was a Harvard dropout. <laughs> I played this game as a child. This is the edition I played. A lot of you probably played this game. And if you had an extremely unfortunate childhood, you played this one. <laughs> SpongeBob comes from the edition that Hasbro, which bought the Milton Bradley Company, brought out in the 1990s when it revised the game of life to make it more marketable to the baby boomer parents who had grown up with it. Notable here, as if the station wagons first swell into minivans and then into speedboats. The game of life, that 1960 game, had been criticized. It is, after all, you can now remember, incredibly grubby. 
It is just a shamelessly amoral and cash con conscious monster of a board game. The team of designers who were charged with updating it in the 1990s to make it somehow have a social conscience gave up. Whenever they tried to change the rules and make it about, less about having money, it, the rules just didn't work anymore. So while they came up with, you will remember this too, are these life tiles, where like you can get rewarded for doing good, but the only reward in the game is money. <laughs> so how did the game of life begin? Milton Bradley always said that he had invented this game from scratch. He said that on his patent application, which he filed with the U.S. Patent Office in 1866. That wasn't true, it wasn't true, remotely true. The genealogy of the checkered game of life stretches back centuries, as most ideas do, and across oceans and around the world. Bradley's game of life is descended from a family of ancient Southeast Asian games. In India, the game of knowledge is played exactly like the game of life. You land on a virtue, and you get to climb a ladder toward Vishnu. Land on a vice, and you are swallowed by a snake. This might seem familiar to you, too. In the 19th century, games from the farthest reaches of the British Empire were imported and found their way into middle-class Victorian parlors. The game of knowledge was sold in Britain as snakes and ladders as early as 1892. In the United States, I played it as a kid. You may have played shoots and ladders, too. India, then, is where Milton Bradley got his game board. But the idea for his game of life came from somewhere else. The first game of human life was printed in London in 1790, when board games were new. Life here is a Christian voyage to salvation. You begin at the infant. Your goal is to die. Whoever dies first wins. <laughs> and your reward is to become, at 84, the immortal man. The next game of life, The Mansion of Bliss, was printed beginning in 1800. It looks a lot like the game of human life. It's pretty much a copycat game, a, a pilgrimage from birth to salvation. Then came The Mansion of Happiness, where there are social networks, I'm sure, somewhere to be discovered which before the checkered game of life was the most popular board game in the United States for decades. For most of the 19th century, this was the game you were given for a present when you were a kid. One of the things that's interesting about it is that the board games that survive in archives are famously underplayed. They're in perfect condition. Kids really did not like to play this game. It kind of, it's a terrible game. <laughs> I, I've, I've made my children play it and it's, it's a horrible, horrible game. There is. There is no way to win because you just keep getting sent back to infancy no matter what you, what you do. Because you are bad. It is, it is a bad, it's a fire and brimstone game. But like the Mansion of Bliss, it represents immortality, life's final destination as a heavenly mansion. You can see it here in the very center of the board. That is where you're headed for at the end of your life. And you can get there only after rolling an exact score from a square called the Day of Reckoning. So even if you get all the way to the Day of Reckoning, you can never get to the Mansion of Happiness because you will never roll the three. I've no, no one's ever won this game. I've played it a lot. After the Mansion of Happiness, then, came Milton Bradley's checkered game, which, as you can see, is quite different. It's that Indian board game board with those evangelical Christian ideas embodied in it. Except there's not that much Christianity in this game. It has a very different principle for what counts as success. And then a century later came this game, the one I played as a child. There's a day of reckoning on the game board of this game as well. You may remember that day of reckoning. Do you remember what you do on the day of reckoning in life? You count your cash. <laughs> you do not count your good deeds to see if you are allowed to enter the mansion of happiness only to find out you are not. You count your cash to see if you're going to the poorhouse or to millionaire acres not to see whether you're fated to become an immortal man. By 1960, the Mansion of Happiness was a 5,000-square-foot house in a retirement community. And now? In 2007, just before a global financial meltdown involving securities fraud, subprime mortgages, and bad debt, 
Hasbro introduced a wholly new and reimagined game called the Game of Life Twists and Turns. Does anyone play this game? You guys are too old for this game. I want you to just think about that. You are too old for a game that was invented just a few years ago. In this version of the Game of Life, life is aimless. There is no place, there's a place to begin, but it's not called infancy, it's just called start. You cannot die, you cannot grow old, you cannot sin, you cannot be good. There is no end. There's a, no place on the board called happy old age, there's no millionaire acres either. The game board is divided into four squares, live it, learn it, love it, earn it. And through each of these a colored path snakes its way. You begin by using a tiny plastic skateboard as a game piece. It's very Sean White. <laughs> then if you want, you can convert it into a convertible. You can buy a house if you want. You can buy a modest house for $200,000 or a mansion for a million. You pay 10% a year on your mortgage. You're not expected to calculate that because you can use this iPod in the middle of the game. There is no paper in this game except for these cards which assign you your career. Instead of cash, each player gets a Visa brand credit card made out in the name of Milton Bradley, who is still making good all those years after dropping out of Harvard. What is the meaning of life in the game of twists and turns? In twists and turns, whoever ends up with the most life points wins, but technically the game is endless, and it is really is endless if you've ever tried to play it because its only object is to experience all that life has to offer. With Milton Bradley's Visa card in hand, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. No one cares. There are no consequences. The game board screams, a thousand ways to live your life. You choose. The history of games then tells a story about the history of ideas, about life and death, about the questions people have asked and the answers they have come up with over centuries. It is a story about a voyage to nowhere. Faith in eternity, faith in money, faith now in what? Twists and turns is the endless, aimless game of liberal modernity. How does life begin? What does it mean? What happens when you're dead? Eh, you choose. That is the past. This is the present. This is you. What is the future? And the question is, what is your game? Thank you.